This Warhammer Fantasy roleplay campaign has strong language and adult themes. The enemy within. As we left off before the break, the four of you were walking back around to your coach, which was further down the road from the crashed coach that you've now corrected. And you were walking to meet with Lady is Old. I'll hand it back over to you guys if you want to do anything on the way or... I mentioned the fact that uh, the uh, Black Arrow is near Bogenhofen. In case that... In case, just for anyone who didn't who missed that. And anything else? No. Uh, Astrid's fiddling with the sword. And kind of trying to clean it. That's about it. Okay. Well, I think we walk over then. As you approach down the road and turn the bend around to your coach, it's back on the road. It's got two horses. Gunnar and Holtz are standing next to it. You can see that Holtz is leaned over against the coach and Gunnar is patting him on the back. As you get closer, you see Lady Isolde's servant climb out of the coach. She opens the door and she beckons you over with a hand. Okay, I put on a... I smirk somewhat as I come over. The servant looks at everyone in the face except Deatric as she tells all of you, um, please climb into the coach. All right. Yeah, I believe you so. Mm -hmm. Astrid uh, might make it creak a little, but she's getting in there. As the coach shakes and creaks as you all climb on, Astrid and Jan, your bulging muscles are up against the bulging muscles of the large muscular woman that's been with the lady as you will squeeze in against one another. And Fisk and Deatric are a little more elegant about climbing on, sitting next to the lady is old as the servant waits outside in the rain. The lady uh, is old. Oh, go ahead, Astrid. I was going to start off by saying Astrid's kind of awkwardly coughs and says, uh, Madame, you wish to speak with us? She's looking out of the window of the coach as you got in. She didn't look at any of you when you got in. And as she's looking off and you say that, Astrid, she says, This wilderness is both beautiful and deadly. And today you displayed selfless bravery, which cannot be falsified. She looks over to you, Deatric. And she says, I apologize for throwing away your letter this morning. I assumed you had ill intent, but after seeing this this afternoon, I now realize that you are honorable people. Okay. I know. Thank you, my lady. I would like to hire your services for a matter that requires discretion. And I would need word of your discretion before I discuss it with you. My uh, lips are sealed. Indeed. Show me, ma'am. What is it? Fisk, she glances at you, waiting for approval. And it never comes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I um, nudge Fisk with an elbow. <laughs> I'll make the assumption that Fisk has agreed, as he seemed pretty honourable up until this point. Oh, yeah. She nods in acknowledgement. And she says, I am not Lady Azol. I am Gravin Maria Ulrich von Liebwitz from Abstein, niece of Elector Countess Emmanuel of Nunn. I travel as Lady Azol because there are those who would seek to harm me and must keep my identity a secret until I reach the Three Feathers Inn, where my entourage are waiting for me. Mm -hmm. I am traveling under the name Lady Azol, so that once I reach the Three Feathers and my identity is shown, I believe there will be an assassin after me. I cannot prove who it is or when they will strike, but I have good word that it will be at the Three Feathers Inn. What I propose is that I will pay for your lodging and meals and anything else there, and I will also pay each of you two shillings. And in return, I would ask that you please 
keep an eye on everyone that enters the inn and potentially determine who is out to try and assassinate me, as well as keeping an eye on those around me. What say you? Can you guys hear me at this point? Yes. Yep. Yep. Nice. Sorry, Fisk. So, sorry to interrupt everyone. The Lady is old is saying she's not the Lady is old. She's actually yeah. uh, the niece of an Elector Countess, and she believes someone's going to try and assassinate her at the Three Feathers Inn. So she'd like to pay for all of your lodgings and also pay each of you two silver shillings in order to try and figure out who the assassin is. Ooh, heck. Two old shillings. Yeah, me, Lady. I, I could help with that. Free lodgings, too. Um, do you have my sword? Two shillings seems a little light for an assassination attempt, but definitely have my support, and I will we'll see this through. I, I nod. I can never see a lady come to harm. Especially when her aunt is the elector countess from your old neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she. Well, I don't have to mention that part. <laughs> she seems quietly pleased. Her demeanor's changed throughout this, you know, brief exchange. And she says to you, I thank you for agreeing to this, but I don't mean to insult your integrity when I say I cannot emphasize the need for discretion enough. If this assassin is alerted and flees, they will likely come back to get me again, and I don't believe I would be able to get word of when they would return. I please ask that you don't act until you are certain. Do you, do you have any... Fear that it may be uh, the uh, owners of the inn. I cannot say. I cannot say whether it is someone with me, whether it is someone that works there, or someone who will be visiting. Okay. Someone, someone with you? Do you mean some of your servants could be under suspicion? I trust Jenna and Marie here with my life, which is why they are traveling with me while I am trying to stay away from any prying eyes. But once we reach the Three Feathers, I will be open with you about the situation. I am expected in Kemperbad. I am supposed to be on trial for a crime I did not commit. And I have a champion who will be fighting on my behalf. I am meeting with him, my lawyer, and several other members of my entourage who I am not as familiar with. And I do not feel safe. I would honestly feel safer with the four of you watching over my shoulder while Marie keeps me safe. She looks to the very large muscular woman with her as she says, Marie, so you can determine that Jenna is the seven. Aww. Who's the small, what's the small mousy one's name again? Jenna. Okay. Oh, so Jenna's not the bodyguard. Is Jenna bigger than Maxine? Oh, no, not Maxine, uh, Astrid. Oh, sorry, uh, Marie, the, the bodyguard. Yeah. Um, she is, is bigger than Astrid, or roughly the same size, I'd say. Astrid's she's got 5'7", got... but she's got some width. What's your strength, by the way, Astrid? Uh, 40. Even. Okay. M Marie has 56, so she's pretty oh, muscular. <laughs> Dang. That's a lot. <laughs> she's like kissing their bicep while you're comparing your muscles. <laughs> Like a pair of pro wrestlers from the 80s. <laughs> hmm. Well, I mean, I happily accept, mm. but uh. This may be, uh. I hope it's not out of place for me to ask. You, in terms of any sort of assassin, does the mark of a black hand mean anything to you? She looks to Marie as she shakes her head, and Marie shrugs, and um, the Gravin Marie. Sorry, I'm going to refer to the lady as old as the Gravin Marie now, which is her name. She shakes her head and says, no, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Worth a shot. Well, have you got any other clues about who's, who's trying to off you? Or are we, going to, are we going to notice their agents? Because if you just want someone watching the door for trouble, we can do that. As you use the phrase, off you... There is a slight physical reaction from her <laughs> as she looks back and says, I'm very sorry, I have no information on who is attempting to harm me, but I would 
be happy to pay you the two shillings to watch over me, and if you are able to apprehend them, I will give you each an additional shilling. All right. All right. Uh, my lady, I do have one question, though, as far as rewards go. Yes? Uh, may I ask a small boon instead of a shilling for monetary payment? A small what? Boon, or a favor, or consideration. She'll pull an inquisitive face and respond, go on. I, uh, money is not the most important, but status is specifically those who are uh, in arms in service of the Empire. And if we are successful in our mission, and I have no doubt that we are, I uh, would ask perhaps your consideration in any sort of posts or openings in the Empire's army. She smiles and she says, Of course, I typically spend a lot of my time in Middenheim. After my trial in Camperbad, I will be back up to Middenheim. If you ever find yourself visiting there, please seek me out. Of course, it's my home city, so I truly appreciate it, ma'am. I will pay you, lady, and I will also speak well of all four of you, if you are Thank able you. to assist me. Uh, Astrid will kind of give a, a small bow with her head, even though I imagine her frame is pretty hunched in the, in the ca carriage as well. There's a banging at the coach door, and as you look over, you see Philippe standing in the pissing rain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Shall we? Uh... Yeah, I'll open. I'll, I'll just kind of open the door and say, "Yeah, yeah, what? It is pouring rain out here. Let, let me in." Uh, lady is old. Should we let him in? Uh, if we must. I believe Come we're done in, here, then. aren't we, gentlemen? Yes. And lady, mm -hmm. shall we leave one of our own here to keep watch over you for the remainder of the journey? Mm, yes, I'm certain that Jenna would appreciate having your friend here present. She points to Dietrich. Perfect. Take it away, man. All yours. So as you clamber out of the coach, Fisk, Jan, and Astrid, Philippe is <laughs> looking pissed off like he's done more work today with his hands than he has in years as he climbs onto the coach sopping wet and you hear the gravin marila out ah as he climbs on sopping wet jenna the servant also climbs in where dietrich and the lady are sitting and uh, yeah the three of you are left standing out in the road in the mud next to the coach you can hear holtz coughing and spluttering and gonna saying go on lad get it up get it up yeah, and I'll just climb back on top of the coach, I guess, with the uh, coachman. Yep. Excellent. Astrid will do the same, and she's not very keen on those bastard Sigma road wardens, unless they're so nerds. Well, the sergeant's all right, but the rest of them yep. are kind of... <laughs> the sergeant gets paid more. That's the long and short of it. <laughs> um, so we're going back to the roof of the carriage. Yeah, yeah, I get. It. Well, at least I am. Yeah, I'll go up as well. Um, I was curious. Uh, I don't know if uh, there's a way for me to ask it in persona, but is anyone with us any good at uh, bartering or selling things once we get to Altdorf? Uh, out of care. I'm good at evaluating how much they're worth. Yeah, and Astrid's got trade. I'm mm. actually alarmingly good at hag haggling somehow. Oh, good. <laughs> 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 You're a man of the people. They, uh, they. So I could tell you how much it's worth. Astro could trade it, and uh, is it Fisk? Can yep. uh, haggle over the price? Oh, Jan, I think. You mean. Jan. Then we can divvy it up because that that if we're uh, if we do well enough, we could get one gold per uh, axe for each yet uh, for each of us. Ooh. That would be a nice little start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't mind it at all. While we're on the subject of trade, do you guys, I mean, you don't have to make a decision now, 
Um, we can play it by ear and depending on circumstance of the items as well. But for minor items like that, do you prefer to do the trading in between sessions or during the session? Or are you not bothered? Good question. Um, I'd be fine either way, but I'd be fine doing mm. it in between. Yeah, I'd favor between sessions. It would be probably be best to do it like a shortened version of it, like at the end of each session. So like yeah, rather okay. than role-playing, finding That'd the shots, fine, just... Like, look, I want to haggle for this. I want to buy this, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Some people really enjoy that aspect of it, but yeah, unless there's a specific item, if you're just dumping off a bunch of axes, we can just run through that. Right. Okay. Excellent. Gunnar and Holtz climb back up. You can see uh, Holtz trying to dry out the blunderbuss as he's getting it back into the box, and Gunnar is gathering the reins he looks back at the three of you on the roof and he asks are we ready to go then yeah yeah now hopefully we've uh or oh, you've sobered up respectfully speaking that is oh well, i'm i'm fucking sober now after that try on he cracks the the reins and it begins to trundle forward and as you round the bend towards the road wardens you hear the road sergeant crack the reins and announce, onwards! And the other four road wardens flank you. You have two on either side of the road sergeant's coach and two on either side of your coach, occasionally glaring at Fisk and Astrid. Dietrich, how's the atmosphere inside the coach in, in the nice warm coach? Oh, am I still inside? Yes, unless you wanted to climb on the roof, you're more than welcome. No, I'm happy to stay inside. I mean, uh, I'm taking, I'm t like, uh, I'm closing my eyes and relaxing a bit. Actually, can I t like look at Philippe a bit? I'm wondering if he could be an assassin. Oh, why don't you make a? Do you think an intuition would match, or are you looking for perception for anything? Uh, I mean, they're both the same stat for me, so. Okay, so let's just use that stat and then. See if you can determine much of anything. Okay, that wasn't a success. Okay, so it's like a plus zero. Yeah, like I think I was like it's forty. My stat is forty four, so that's like minus one or zero. I'll tell you what, you're in this coach ride for a while. You're sitting across from him. We'll give you a plus twenty to that because I mean you're not under pressure here, so yeah. you have two successes. Okay. Excellent. As you're watching Philippe without him realizing that you're watching Dietrich, he's playing around with his hands. He's got a deck of cards. And then you realize that he's slipping cards up his sleeve and slipping them out, practicing cheating uh, mm -hmm. as he moves them around in his hand. But as you watch him, other than the sword and the, the pistol, he doesn't appear to have much else about him. He's not paying uh, much attention to the gravin. Or anyone else, um, he seems to be keeping to himself for the most part. So the only thing you notice of interest is that he's practicing cheating people at cards. Okay. Well, I think my character is slightly worn out from the fighting beforehand, so he's going to take a nap along the way. Okay. How are the uh, the roof crew doing? Uh, Astrid swapping glares with the. Uh... <laughs> the road wardens like a fish in water yep. I'm just used to abuse and bad conditions so I'm, I'm... <laughs> well, well I mean with, with my strength and toughness I'm more, more than capable of just enduring it I don't care you've all got cloaks I mean you're, you're protected from the rain you're not going to yeah. catch a cold yeah. Jan as, as, as you're sitting there on top of the coach you, you think you see something out of the corner of your eye on the top of the coach and you look round and the rest of the party see you jump as you notice that the young man, Ernst, is still sitting reading a book under a cloak next to the baggage. He's been completely unnoticed throughout the attack, throughout the road wardens. He's just been reading his book. I just think to myself, oh, gosh, wish I could read. <laughs> That's what I class people do, innit? Gotta learn to read me someday. It's difficult to see through this rainfall, everyone, as you're 
looking out from the top of the coach. Gunnar and Holtz in front of you, very awake now, road wardens either side of you. And as the rain grows a little heavier, it's visib- visibility is cutting off after about 150 feet from the coach. It's quite difficult to see. And as it trundles down the muddy road, you hear these sounds up ahead cutting through the weather as they begin to breach the rain. You hear clang, clang, clang. And Gunnar perks up a bit. He looks up and as if to put your minds at ease, he says, that's Ursum Village. That's their blacksmith that you can hear. Mm. And before long, the road passes through a small hamlet. It's not stopping off here because you are cut for time trying to get to the Three Feathers Inn. And as it passes through by the roadside, there's a bunch of children playing in the mud. And as the coach passes, they wave and smile to anyone who looks their way. Gunnar pulls a face and sticks his tongue out at one of them as they begin laughing. As the coach passes through this small hamlet with the children playing and exits and turns around the corner, you will see a burnt body hanging by its neck from a tree at the roadside. A sack is pulled over the head. And to anyone who can read, there's a sign on the chest of the body that says, I'm a witch. And as the coach passes, Hultz spits at the body. Uh, Astrid will relay what the sign says to this Kenjan. Just kind of in a low murmur. Don't tell Dietrich. Oh, good news then. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, ours is legal. He's got papers. So we're all good. <laughs> we're all good. While we're trundling along, I'd love to ask uh, Jan. So do you have any twins by any chance? Any siblings? Uh, me? No, no. Got a few brothers, few sisters, no twins. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, for another time. It, it's too late. I've started regaling you about stories of my village. <laughs> <laughs> John, as you entertain your party with stories about your village... It's been a long day. You had some hungover coachmen. They had a mutant attack you, a battle with some other mutants, some road wardens try and con you out some silver, and then you had to help get the coach back together, and now you've agreed to try and stop an assassination attempt. It has been a long day, and everyone looks tired. Fisk can begin to... You hear sounds as the river di- the the rain dies down. There's a river flowing behind the trees. It's um, a familiar sound that Fisk would recognise through the rain. And as the sky begins to grow darker, you see this large river revealed as the tree line breaks. And just down the river, you see a two-story inn with a dock out the back of it. The inn is made of brick and timber walls, which have been whitened with a lime wash, and a wooden sign hangs from chains at the entrance. It's depicting three feathers on the sign. And as you draw closer, you notice that the inn is unusually busy. A large, muscular man with a shaved head and a square jaw stands with a slender older man with a pointed grey beard and both men are flanked by several servants out front of the inn as other lackeys rush in and out from coaches bringing things in and around and as your coach approaches the three feathers inn the large muscular man walks up to your coach as it stops he opens the door puts out a hand and the gravin marie takes his hand as he helps her down she steps down out front and the older man bows along with the servants, and they bring the Gravin Marie in. As Marie, the bodyguard, steps out from the coach, the big muscular woman who was competing with Astrid for biceps, all the guards standing out salute her. 
they all march inside and leave you all in the carriage or on top and servants begin to rush the coach clambering onto the top to grab luggage and pull it down get it out of the back getting in through the door to pull bags out quickly there's no politeness now that the gravin's gone you see ernst oh. the young man oh go ahead i was gonna say i was gonna follow i'm i was gonna follow her out absolutely yeah so i'm behind her like maybe about like a couple feet or so as you do do trick the slim older man with the pointed gray beard with her sort of looks over his shoulder and sees you walking behind and you hear him whisper to the gravin marie who is this gentleman behind you and as the gravin marie looks around she just shrugs and says no one he's not with me he was just on the coach mm. as the flurry of servants are crawling over the coach pulling bags off ernst the young man that was under a cloak reading smacks one of the servants with a foot as the servant's trying to grab the book off him thinking he's luggage and he whacks another servant with the back of his book because he quietly climbs down from the coach and makes his way toward the rear of the building and after deatric exits Philippe bursts through the servants and he exits the coat, marching towards the inn, fed up with this day. And as <laughs> the three of you are left on top of the coach, as the servants depart with all the bags, Fisk, Jan and Astrid, you hear the road sergeant call over to you. We'll be moving on. Good work today. Thanks for your assistance. Hey, uh, no problem. Just be uh, more careful next time. You crash the coach. Uh, you know, I say in incompetently hiding the fact that I was the one who crashed the coach. Uh, <laughs> this is the road sergeant, not, not the, uh, the coachman. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll just blame him for crashing the coach. <laughs> <laughs> just as I walk in, just casually. Gunnar oh. and Holtz are preparing the coach um, to be put away for the evening with the horses, speaking with the porter and grabbing some of their belongings. Are there any? Well, in that case, I hope they didn't hear it. But sorry, Astrid, were you saying something? Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jan. Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I was just saying. I just hope they didn't hear it. Yeah. So I was asking if there are any more side eyes from. I think it was Road Warden Schooner. That was her name. She, her one eye is uh, focused on the road. The four road wardens and their road sergeant carry on down the road, you imagine, towards Altdorf. All right. Well, they can, they can go away very politely. There's someone else's problem now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll step inside, though, of the inn, just to take a gander and see what's up. Excellent. Inside the Three Feathers, there are servants hurrying to and fro, and the innkeeper is engrossed in conversation with some kind of scribe who carries a visibly bulging purse, you assume a member of the Gravin's party. There are four large tables, two small tables, a bar, and a fireplace. Two of the large tables and both small tables are free at the moment. As you enter into the tavern you can see that um the large muscular man that was with the gravin is now making his way to a table with some of the guards and the slender man appears to be engaging the gravin marie in conversation as they go upstairs hmm. well i don't know if the and this is addressed to thisk and jan uh, astrid continues i don't know if the inn itself is safe to speak, but is there any code that we want to work out in case we notice any suspicious yeah. people? Uh, code? Code, you know, signs, uh, discreet markings, not necessarily letters. Hmm. What, like, for what? To, to say that we recognize each other? No, uh, if we recognize a threat. Yeah, 
I mean, to, uh, it could be something drastic like flipping a table or discreet well, hand gestures. I don't know. If I if I see anyone suspicious, how about I just deck him? <laughs> I think we need to keep an eye on people who are suspicious. In the wardens, uh, not so much on the river, but we use uh, whistles, bird noises. Ooh. Well, That's not a maybe you should uh, keep an eye out for anyone suspicious. And uh, if you find find them, uh, give us a whistle. All right, we can do that. Oh, I'll look into setting up rooms. Okay. Sure. So I head over to the uh, innkeeper. The innkeeper's at the bar with the scribe talking, and as they're speaking and you approach, they stop and both look at you. The scribe nods to you, Dietrich, and the innkeeper asks, How can I help you? Uh, I'm looking for rooms for me and my companions. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, we have private rooms. We have dormitory. As he asks this, the scribe says, they will take two double rooms, please, and they will be paid for by me. Okay. A few silvers exchange hands, and um, the scribe says, please track any purchases they make this evening, and I will take care of them in the morning. Ooh. All right. Okay. Time for a meal and a drink, at least. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Something really good. Something non-alcoholic, though. So a light beer instead of beer, beer. Okay, I'm. I'm gonna head up and check my check the rooms out. Uh, this Where would. Order? Yeah, there's some of the uh, some of them are uh, around, like the uh, the big strong one and the lawyers. Are they still downstairs? The uh, Weasley looking ones. The slim gentleman has gone upstairs with the Gravin, but um, let me just pull up my notes here. The square-jawed, muscular man that you saw out front that took the Gravin's hand and brought her down from the coach, he's now sitting bare-chested at a large table, arm-wrestling with one of the guards. Other (laughs) patrons are gathered around drinking and shouting encouragement. They're shouting things like, you got him, no problem, bro, no. And as the muscular man slams the guard's hand onto the table, he lets out a vicious roar, and he proclaims, No one can stop me! All right. Astrid will saunter on over. To take They're a little more over. fired up than I expected. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I'll keep an eye out just uh, on all of the... Uh, people we saw associated with the uh, um, what's her title again? I want to say uh, Gravin. So Gravin. Gravin is basically Duchess but from the northern lands where you and Astrid are from. It means like mm-hmm. a lady, a countess. And what can you say that or it one more time so I can put it in my notes? Uh, Gravin, so G-R-A-V-I-N. Yeah. Oh, Can I go to talk to the uh, soldier types arm wrestling? Yeah, absolutely. You can go over there. I believe Fisk was, uh, Astrid was also going over. Yeah, I want to just keep an eye out with anyone who is uh, interacting with the Gravin to see if they're acting suspicious or not drinking or anything that might indicate that they're. You can make a perception test. All right. To keep an eye out. Astrid and Jan, you're both muscular people bigger people. As you approach the big muscular square-jawed man, now bare-chested, sitting table, down in tankards of ale and arm wrestling people, as you approach, he claps his hands together and says, Oh, worthy challenges! Oh, yeah, you soldier types, I'm guessing, by the looks of you. You fresh off duty? Fresh off duty? We serve the great Reverend Marie! I'm not here to arm wrestle any of these fools, including you. <laughs> oh, well, I ain't no soldier, but I thought about, about running off to the army. I bet you I got the muscle for it and all. Muscle you wouldn't last a day in the army, boy, but why don't you sit down and we'll see how tough you are. All right, then. Okay. Um, as you sit down, Jan, he says to you, All right. Bets are one shilling each. Oh no. This is your chilling! This is your chance! 
I ain't got a full shilling, but I got 12 pennies. I think that's a shilling, right? Bloody hell, peasant here. Can't even count. Got pennies on him. All right, lad. I'll take your pennies from you. Well, I only got pennies on me for now, but I bet but I bet I'll be having a shilling in a few minutes. Oh, I like you. <laughs> I like you. All right, I got two success levels on the perception as well. Oh, excellent. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment, Fisk. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do an opposed strength test here. It's challenging, Jan. Oh. I've got a strength of, now that you've placed your bet, 69. Holy shit. Oh. Okay, Google, roll 2d10. Good luck, buddy. Asher kind of gives down a, a You got six and two. That makes eight. Zero. Shit, I got marginal failure. Mm. No, I didn't. 69, I know. got a marginal success. Yep, marginal success. Yeah, marginal success. Little do you know, I got a strength of 40, and strong back gives me one automatic success in the post strength <laughs> test. Oh! Five successes. Mm. Jan, you slam this guy's fist into the table, and the whole table creaks. You think the legs are going to break? He smashes his hand into it so hard, and he lets out a little, Ugh! as you do so. The money on the table jingles, and Jan... You see your first silver shilling sitting in front of you on the table. <laughs> I, I I quickly sweep it all up. Is it? I told you back back in my village, we used used to pick up old trees on our backs. We can throw trees around. I bet I could throw around an old horse as well. Jan, as you're bragging, one of the soldiers lets out a laugh and says, "Bruno lost to a bloody peasant," and as he does. Bruno stands up and slaps him across the face, knocks him into the wall. Beautiful. So it, anyway, I I really really been a fan of you soldier types. I mean, we occasionally got some for any of the uh, shady types in the woods. You know, the fucking beastmen. We uh, had visitors then, but uh, I've always wanted to join the army. You were, uh, you, you lad. Lad served long? Served long enough, lad. Long enough to know when I'm beat. But mostly I do jewels at the moment, especially for the Gravin Marie. I'm going to be defending her honour, but I can't say any more than that. Oh, du duels? They're, uh, how'd you, get e how'd you even get in that line of work? By winning a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess in the future maybe I could try some of winning. I tell you what, lad, I'm going to have a bit of dinner, a couple of ales, and we're going to try this again. All right, sounds fine by me. He points to Astrid. What about you, love? Uh, I'll be testing and earning a shilling, too. I tell you what, sit yourself down, love. You look tougher than half the guards around here. I'm straight. All right, let's make an opposed test there, Astrid. Gotcha. Okay, Google, roll 2d10. It's three and five for a total of eight. Mm. Three success levels. So, quick question. I have the strong back. Uh, I guess that would be a talent. Or mm -hmm. what exactly does that do as well? Yeah, um, that, that's the one. It's, I think because it says like tests. It's like tests you can add your talent level to. So it gives you one automatic success in opposed strength levels. Opposed strength right. tests. So if I use that, would that uh, lend me a success in this instance? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's like any opposed strength test. Ooh. Well, Jim? Yeah, how'd you get on? Uh, one success level for me. Oh, you rolled and you got zero successes, so you get plus one? Yes. Okay. In that case, you put up a decent fight, Astrid, but Bruno manages to bring your arm crashing down onto the table, and then he slams his fist and goes, oh, I've still got it. One shilling, love. Ah, oh, shit. Astrid begrudgingly pays up. Okay, I'm going to take a 12 brass from you because you don't have any shillings. Okay. 
So before we come to do your trick, going upstairs to check the rooms, Fisk, you made a perception test. Yes. As you sit, well, actually, you haven't sit yet. You're standing with Jan and Astrid, as far as we know, right? And keep keeping an eye on everyone else, making it. I imagine making it look like you're involved in the celebrations of the arm wrestling, but keeping an eye out. Yeah. Okay. As you set your eyes upon the tavern, you see Philippe has set up at a table in the corner with a bottle of wine, a deck of cards, and trying to invite anyone over to play with him. Of course. As he's sitting at the table, trying to make polite conversation with those around him and being brushed off for the most part, you see these three scholars come in out of the rain and they hang their heavy cloaks and hats up to dry and they take a seat at a table ordering drinks and food and quietly speaking amongst themselves. Mm. After a couple of minutes, you then see a halfling, which is quite a rare sight, come in and he equates himself uh, with the table that Philippe is at, and the halfling and Philippe begin to play a round of cards. Mm. Dietrich, as you make your way upstairs, there's left and there's right at the top of the stairs. So to the left, there's two guards wearing the liveries of um, the Lady Gravin. All her guards are wearing the same liveries. And they're stopping anyone from going left at the top of the stairs, all those rooms likely reserved for her. Your rooms okay. are to the right, and as you turn to the right and go to them, there are two double rooms. You open the doors, there's two beds in each one. They're pretty swanky, considering where you slept last night, so they're a nice pair of rooms. All right, is there like some kind of key to lock them? Yes, you've been given a key, so you can lock right. either of them. Okay, I'm going to put, put my uh, spare stuff away. Leaving my star and uh, lock the room. Do I notice anything uh, wrong with the? Or do like? Is, are there any other ways of getting into her room apart from through the corridor? The Gravin. Yeah, into the Gravin's rooms. Yeah. Um, what skill do you think you'd use to figure out how easy it would be to get to her? Maybe intuition. Is yeah. That more. Perception, maybe? Yeah, maybe uh, perception or evaluate. Okay, evaluate. Yeah, okay, go for it. One. So uh, that's five success levels. Holy moly, excellent. So before we come back to the rest of the party, Deatrick, you can see there's guards there, and with your crafty mind, you know that you're not getting past them without raising some suspicion, which you assume is not wanted in this situation. So you make your way downstairs and outside. As you come out into the fresh air, it's that nice, fresh, cool feeling of evening air after a rainfall throughout the day when it's died off. And it's quite nice breathing in that cool air as you come outside. You begin to walk around the building to evaluate it. As you do, you see that there's a, a boat at the dock and you see Ernst, the young man who'd been reading at the other end and then on the coach with you, climbing onto the boat and departing. As you begin walking further around the inn, you can see that there are windows for each room. And using your um, crafty mind and evaluation, you determine that one of these two windows must be the Gravins up around the end in the corner. It would make sense. Okay. Uh, hmm. I've got... Uh... Is there, like, a way of climbing up there? You... Anyone could climb up, because it's... The the side of the tavern, as I described, is made from brick and timber. So there are timber yeah. beams on the outside that you could grab onto window ledge. If you were quick enough, you could definitely get up there. Okay. I probably can't, but... And it would be easy enough, for like, uh, if you had a crossbow to, like, just when she comes up to the window. Yes. To fire through. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to head back into the uh, inn, and I'm going to write write a uh, little. I'm going to write a note mentioning this. Uh, the other thing is, hey Astrid. Hmm? Yeah. Yes. Outside. You'll disentangle yourself from. I think the champion's name is Bruno. Yes. Yeah. She'll kind of. Or disengage yourself from, from that. And, uh, subside in the banter. Okay. Uh, I show her the, like, the outside. Alright. Do you, um, like, do you have any spare knives? Ooh, uh, actually, I do. Or, well, actually, even the axe blade. Uh, so, you want axes or daggers? Well, he, here's two things. So, for, like, I should, like, these, like, one of these is the, the room to, uh, the, the uh, this, one of these is a lady's room. And I'm wondering if an enterprising, uh, assassin could just climb up through here. Hmm. Uh, out of character, Jim, do you want me to roll, maybe, intuition to uh, see, you... like, uh, envision and get on the same page? No, if Dietrich can relay information with you, he's yeah. got, he succeeded enough in evaluating it. Okay. So, I've so one. I think we should slip a note mention mentioning to not go near the window, so mm-hmm. she can't just get shot. But the other thing is, what about if we hide a knife between the uh, wooden beams on the uh, climb up? Like, if somebody so... tries to climb up, we can get them to, like, cut their hand open. And that'll mark them. Pun? And that'll mark them. Yeah, I mean, we'll probably hear the scream if they uh, try and do that. We could sharpen the axe blades and maybe get Jan to volunteer for some work detail. And uh, him and I could probably rig something up. Yeah, I think that's probably the best. Yeah. I, I pass a, a like a note, like slip these through one of the doors, or through one of the windows, as well. So, sounds like a good plan to me. Yeah. Astrid will then, unless uh, Dietrich is wanting to talk about anything else, she'll kind of head inside and oh, yeah, see if she can't. Like a uh, like a physician guy, like wasn't he like trying just heading to Altdorf? The Young man, Ernst, with the book. Yeah. Yeah, he, you saw him climbing onto a boat out the back on the dock, and he departed as you were coming out of the building. Do I, Can I see where he might have departed to? It looks like he was heading down the river towards Altdorf as well. That would be the only way that it heads. Okay. So he's just taking a different route. Likely, yeah. There appears to be no other coaches here that aren't belonging to Gunnar and Holtz or the Gravin, and he is loaded onto that boat and taken off. Okay. Uh, then uh, I'll head back in. Side. As you head back in, you can hear this big, bald, muscly guy just, <laughs> yeah, I'll take anyone in a bit. And as he's letting out, you know, his crass banner with everyone. A liveried servant comes downstairs and orders him. The Gravine requests you cease roughhousing in the event you injure yourself and are no longer fit to serve as champion. And Bruno stands up abruptly to this, towering over the servant and tells him, Mind your own business, boy. And the servant quickly retreats back upstairs. <laughs> As you're standing watching Bruno with this, after a few minutes and more banter, the Gravin comes down the stairs with three servants. And she's just staring at Bruno. And she doesn't say anything. And Bruno quietly gets up from the table. And he begins to make his way upstairs. Bless his heart. As okay. that's happening, um, servants are ordering supper for the Grevin's party. Um, the guards and some of the servants eat in the bar while several meals are rushed upstairs for others. So the Gravin and her champion and and 
a half a dozen of them eat upstairs. We should get our uh, free meal. Yeah. And talk about what you guys discovered and what I discovered. Yep. Should one of us like uh should one of us keep a watch outside though? I think that'd be a good idea for the night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh maybe take a meal to go and relax with a cup of water and uh you know, whatever is quick and easy to take along. Okay. I'll I'll make a note by the way, I'll make a note about like the the meal and the price for the meals. Okay, absolutely. They've got a bunch of stuff here because it's quite a large tavern. Um, yeah. yeah, they've got humble pie, porridge, rabbit stew, roasted chicken and potatoes, more um, rumps to specials. I'm, um, I'm just keeping a note so that I can hand it back, hand it over to the uh, uh, scribe. Okay. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, so you guys, you know, load up on whatever food you want, you know, beef and beer pies, chopped liver, whatever takes your fancy from the menu um does anyone have any specific dishes that they enjoy uh i think we just we just eat well right big pieces of meat yeah excellent fisk they might even have a a good old bit of rye keel on the menu absolutely eat some northerners food (laughs) i need a Need a fish that's stuffed and stuck underground for 14 days, if I recall. They they have a bunch of ales here. Um, the ones from before, like Dark Choice, um, Old Fortitudes, Tabernheim, mm. Goat Kicker Ale. They've got a bunch of different wines, whether they're Bretonian or from the right clan themselves. And, gotcha. Um, here I thought spirits. you said eel. Yeah, right eel. Sorry. It's a creature from the 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 Reich, the river, yeah. that occasionally is caught and chopped up and cooked. Yeah, I'll have a fiscal have something fishy and a strong drink, uh, much to the chagrin of his compatriots. Okay, um, do you guys grab one of the large tables? Do you take up on one of the smaller tables? Uh, I think we're looking for a table that, that keeps an eye on the uh, like staircase and the uh, entrance. Yeah, absolutely. There's one of the small tables that sits off to the side so you can see everyone that comes in without them seeing you, and you've got a clear view up the stairs. Yeah. Perfect. Before everyone begins, could you make a consume alcohol test? Sorry, Astrid, go ahead. Absolutely. I was wondering from the bartender if actually Astrid could grab just an empty wine bottle. He will look at you oddly, but he'll comply. Oh, wonderful. Is this a message in a bottle situation, Astrid? No, it's too. Uh, <laughs> it's as an impromptu weapon that can be shattered over the heads of enemies and to make it look like Astrid's been drinking. Ah. I gotta put some points in to consume alcohol. Terrible Nordlander. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh. <laughs> oh shit! Do you maybe want to re-roll that? Yeah, can I use a a fate a fortune to re-roll? Or yeah, absolutely. You not do it on a okay. On on any uh, roll you can, yeah. Oh man, you want a good old point of corruption? Uh nah. <laughs> Let's get drunk. <laughs> there will be plenty of corruption to go around going forward. The four of you sit at your small table in the Three Feathers Inn. Although Bruno has sulkily made his way off to bed, people are still talking, drinking, laughing. The Uh, three Scots. I think one of us mentioned staying outside to keep an eye out. Could be me. Um, It was mentioned, uh, I don't know if it's the way we want to go, but Jan could uh, do some work outside and keep an eye out at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. But Jan's also living it up with uh, free meals and booze for. Yeah, I want my booze for a peasant. Astrid will definitely toast Jan's victory against Bruno. Because that was pretty impressive. Yeah. Jan and Astrid, if you're both drinking as well, could you make me a consume alcohol test? Oh no, Astrid's refraining. Or more so using the empty wine bottle as a cover. Oh, okay, no problem. Yep. Like a faux cheers. 
Yeah. So what difficulty consume alcohol? Uh, I believe it's challenging. Or actually, it could be average. Let me check for you real quick. I failed no matter what. Yeah. (laughs) What did you roll? Got minus, uh, I think it was 80-something, so I got minus four. Oh, rest in peace, buddy. (laughs) What kind of ale are you drinking here, John? Are you drinking... You know, like a, a regular ale, you getting a strong, thick, dark stuff. What are you on? Uh, some some cheapish ale, but I'm getting a second glass of it as well. Second tankard. All right, we'll give you a, a plus twenty then if you're on the 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 weaker, cheaper stuff. Uh, I pass then, as I down me two drinks. Excellent. So the four of you are sitting at your small table, drinking, free. eating. Oh, three, sorry. So who's outside? Yeah. I think it's Fisk. I'm, He's uh, getting still... drunk and uh, keeping and an eye watching. Astrid was going to volunteer to go outside, actually. Unless anybody wants to go inside. She'll, uh, she's kind of discussing in low murmurs and tones that she could probably play the part of an inebriated individual. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to share with you guys before we got split up that... uh. Um, the only people of note are uh, a halfling that wandered in. Um, very rare uh, could be that he's a specialist, or it could just be a f- friendly face. Um, the other thing is uh, a bunch of scholars came in, three of them, and they started murmuring together um, over their ale. Um, I did not see the halfling drink any, so we might want to keep an eye on him. Okay. I got you. I'll... I'll... I'll talk to the uh, scholars after after I finish eating. Do you, do you think Excellent. we should do something about them? Uh, I think just we should just be keeping an eye out for these sorts of things. I think that I think the big fear is if if they uh, manage to sneak f- past her room, or if uh, somebody shoots her while she's moving around outside of her rooms. I mean, I can do something about them if you want. I got experience. Maybe talk. To, maybe talk to the halfling. All He's right, I will. Charm. I'll uh, buy a third tankard of ale, <laughs> and with it in hand, I'll go up to the halfling, and I'll go. Oi! So what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> You're not sharing in the fucking festivities. Not Make me a consume alcohol test, Oh, Lord. <laughs> Highlight of the session. Beautiful. <laughs> right, so I'm, I'm, a li- I'm a little sloshed. Oh, did, oh, you failed. Okay. Okay, so excellent. One failure. Okay, not too bad. So, yeah, you're, you're a little inebriated. As you say this, the halfling is looking up at you wide-eyed. He has a bulbous nose, and he's particularly small, a halfling. And Philippe starts to laugh nervously and says, ha, ha, My friend, I am trying to work here. Oh, is, is, is he with you? We are enjoying a, a, a game of cards. Oh, all right. Excuse me, then. And I'll just kind of shuffle off. As you're shuffling off, Jan, you can hear the halfling ask, What's his problem, then? <laughs> I'll just go back to yours. He, he, he's with Fweep. <laughs> Why don't you uh, go upstairs now? Oh, all right, if you don't need me, I'll go check out the beds. Check nothing's yeah. in them. Fun? I- I'll go check nothing's hiding in the beds, then. Well, there are my items in the bed. And I'll, I'll go upstairs, look look for our beds, and okay. I'll uh, I don't dry my clothes out and, I don't know, have a nap. I just quick note out of character, I didn't give him the keys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be upstairs rattling the doors then. I mean, that's fine. I'll you're be down in a few minutes not... to look for them. Okay. Uh, I, I go over to the scholars. And start listening in. Fisk is nodding off at over his cup. 
Okay, um, make me a perception test for hearing then. It'll be challenging. For who? Because it's quite loud. Um, for Dietrich. Okay. And Fisk, you're outside, is that right? I can be. Cool. I thought Astrid was, though. Oh, yeah. Astrid's yeah. outside. Okay, Astrid will come, come to you in a moment, then. This can join, join her, too, if it wants to. Okay, I don't hear anything before I uh, reach them. Okay. Are you just going to stand right next to them? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll I'll say hi. I'll I'll come and say hello. I'll say I'm a fellow student of life. They'll nod to you, and one of them will say, "Hello, nice to meet you." Nice to meet you. Where are you heading from? Um, <clears throat> we're heading from none. We're, we're from none. We're heading to uh, um, Altdorf. Oh, same then. Do I do I know these people? Or would you, I recognize? You wouldn't, them? you wouldn't recognize them. Do you have law for noun at all? I, I guess you wouldn't because it's not really a typical no, town. But I do skill. come from noun, so yeah. So what would we use here? Was it intelligence? It's intelligence. Yeah, it make me an intelligence test. Okay. Okay, so that's a like. A failure by a uh, one degree. Nice. You recognise the robes familiar from Null. And you've seen them at some point in your past, but you can't place your finger on it. But their accents are definitely from Null, and you'd be able to tell that. Yeah, I, I don't rec- uh, I'm not familiar with you. Oh, um, we are travelling students. We are. Uh... Um, we're heading to Altdorf to uh, continue our studies. <clears throat> oh, what are, you, what are you guys studying? The history of the uh, Reichland, putting together records, that, that type of thing. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll continue chatting with them about what they study. As okay. I, uh, but I'll, keep an, I'll be keeping an eye out. Sure. So for now, we'll pull outside to Astrid. Astrid, you stand out. A nice, fresh, cool evening air here. Yes. And outside of the tavern, there's a couple of people lingering around. You can hear a couple of people drinking and, and laughing, but it's only two or three people at the front. There's some guy that was stumbling back around, clearly relieving himself on the side of the building. And as you approach and look around, you see that there is a boat coming down the river and slowly it comes to a halt and it docks at the dock of the Three Feathers Inn. Mm. A well-dressed man and woman climb off the boat and this man and woman are all over each other, just, you know, hands all over each other, swapping spit as they're walking. You know, it's tough to look at sometimes that's true as they make their way along and these two common looking boatmen are mooring the boat before they climb off the dock and follow the couple who are entering into the uh, tavern all right well um i'm keeping a special eye on the windows to the gravin's room and mm -hmm. also just a general lookout to see if i don't know any suspicious individuals with knives and a sign that says thief for hire or assassin <laughs> in the is walking up. The usual suspects. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. As the rest of you inside the bar, uh, except for Jan. Jan, let's let's hop to you real quick. Are you still upstairs pulling on the door trying to get in? Well, now I know they're locked, I'm gonna try try other doors, the ones that aren't being guarded. Just, just kind of lightly, because I'm actually not sure where our rooms are now. And I suppose I'll have a look upstairs, see what's there. They all appear to be locked on that end of the corridor, but you can see the other side of the stairs down the other corridor. There's two guards there. They're talking quietly, but they're keeping an eye on you as you stumble about pulling on doors. Yeah. Is, th is there a window I can look out of? At the very end of the hallway, there is a window that looks out the back of the inn. And as you glance out, you see 
a man and woman all over each other making their way in the back of the tavern and the two boatmen following. I'll just kind of stare for a while before I go back downstairs. We see Astrid out there wandering about, keeping an eye out. Yeah, fair enough. As this man and woman enter the tavern, Fisk and Dietrich, they speak to the bartender, or the innkeeper briefly, they money exchanges hands and they quickly make their way upstairs. And John, as you make your way back down the corridor, the man and woman that you just saw coming in the tavern, they're giggling and, and kissing and bumping into the walls as they make their way up. And you watch them unlock a door and go into a room and close the door and lock it. And then you hear more giggling and sounds from beyond the door. Well, I'll go downstairs and join the people down there. You see Dietrich sitting at a table with three scholars chatting with them. You see Fisk sitting alone at a small table with a beer, trying to stay awake. And you see the two boatmen who were approaching the inn come in and they sit down at the large table where Bruno was before, but has now left and they uh, order a couple of ales and start drinking. Yeah, I'll, I'll rejoin the group and I'll complain. Uh, you know, I uh, I couldn't get the bloody door open. Would I recognize oh. uh, them as uh, river folk by their uh, garb? For sure. For sure. I think I'd stumble drunkenly over and be like, you're from the river? I'm from the river. <laughs> they look pretty fed up. The river folk usually have long, hard days and they're like, uh, nice to meet you, lad. Which river are you from? Uh, we mainly come up and down the Reich. We uh, do uh, sort of taxiing between the city and further out. Mostly nobles, you know. Do you own your own boat? Oh, I've always wanted a boat. We, we don't own it. We, uh, we pay some of our proceeds to a boat keeper. Oh, I've always wanted a boat. They look at each other briefly, and then one of them looks back at you, Fisk, and says, don't take our boat. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. No, no, never. New friends, old friends, good friends, bad friends. No, no taking boat. All right. Well, uh, why don't you uh, join us? All right. Dietrich and Fisk, can you both make me a gossip test, please? For Dietrich, it's going to be difficult, so uh, minus 10. And for Fisk, it's just going to be challenging, which is zero. Oh. Let me see. Okay. Oh, man. Yeah, I failed. Really okay. Ooh. Let me double check. I think that's a near miss. Yeah, my uh, level is 31. I got a 35. Ooh. Um, you feel like you're about to get something juicy out of them by chance as they mention something related to the man and woman and then they pull back, keep it to themselves and carry on the conversation. Mm. Also, you're pissed. So... Uh, Let's see if that has an effect. No, it wouldn't have an effect. Okay. So they give me they... a sort of boost? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, as Dietrich and Fisk are making friends, Jan, what are you up to? I guess I'll just sit, sit at the table with them, watching the door. Okay. Are you sitting with Fisk or Dietrich, or are you sitting on your own at the small table? Yeah, I'm sitting with them, and okay. I'll, I'll just bore them with questions and and anecdotes from the village. Excellent. Pick, oh, pick, pick the scholars or the boatmen, and yeah, pick one of them and then make a gossip test. I'll go to the scholars, and I'll start talking to them. I'll, I'll ask them okay. what they're studying. I'll half listen and then i'll start bragging about the one time i stole a, a bow from the old vi village under and i proper shot it real good <laughs> i 
Um, for anyone on time constraints, we're going to wrap up in 10 minutes, if that's all right. Sure. That's all right. Sure. That's fine. Not awesome. Good. Oh, yeah. Gossip test. Uh, five. Five successes. No, I've got a roll of five, which is. Oh. Four successes. Hey, that's, okay. that's not bad. As you're speaking to them, Jan and Dietrich, you'd be able to pick this up as well as John pulls it out of them through his friendly and humble conversation. They mention the name Rechtschandler and then quickly seem to change the subject when they accidentally mention this name, Rechtschandler. And the conversation continues on elsewhere. Rechtschandler. Do we know who Rex that is? Chandler. No. I'll write in the chat. Okay. Well, if they wrecked Chandler, I'll drunkenly brag I wrecked a cart once. <laughs> or <laughs> stormed one. Proper at sighting it was. Of course, didn't Excellent. even get a scar from it because I'm proper tough like that. As you guys are all chatting, drinking, having fun, Astrid, you... You see another boat coming in. Well, that's and this suspicious at all. <laughs> this boat that moors up. Three travellers wearing black robes climb off of the boat. Mm-hmm. And the three travellers in black robes have white skulls painted on their faces and black feathers in their headwear. You recognise them as uh, followers of Moor, the god of death. Well, they're not Ulrichian, so they you know beneath. Oh, the... oh, sorry. I'll go ahead, Astrid. Yeah, so, I mean, this isn't very suspicious at all under the circumstances, you know, followers of the god of death, black robes, assassination plots. Uh, I'll keep a special eye on them if they're going inside and... I yeah, assume they, they catch attention if they went inside too. Oh, absolutely. Huh. I mean, these guys are the people that give uh, funeral services. They are doomsayers, so they, the more advanced members of the cult of Moor can predict how you're going to die. It's not typical to see them in a tavern. I mean, followers of Moor... Uh, or cult, members of the cult more aren't evil people that's not what you'd recognize them as but it's odd to see them coming to a tavern at night outside of outdorf on in a boat Flora Galia. yes they approach the inn and unless you stop the master they'll enter no but i will go and check out their boat just peek around yeah they moored it themselves when you were watching them. They appear to be the only people um, that were on the boat. Do you want to get on it and look around it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> As you begin looking around it, there's only really one thing there, which is this blanket, thick wooden blanket pulled over something. As you look under, you um, rub your hand along the the wood of it and you quickly realize it's a coffin one coffin this is <laughs> bad news <laughs> one coffin can, can i is it locked or can i peek in is it occupied uh, so there is a blanket pulled over and tied around it you'd need to cut the rope around it, it in order to get access to the coffin you just you can tell it's a coffin from the wood and the shape of it yeah, uh, I'll check that out, and then I have a, a small plan with the other two boats. Or the boat, and then the other one with the very giddy couple. Are you going to check that boat out too? Yes, well, okay, so my plan is to check out both boats, and then to surreptitiously see if I can't tie the boats together. <laughs> okay. No, I so... mean, if you cut the boats and then let them drift, that'll be pretty noticeable, and... I don't want to actually inconvenience good honest folk. But if they can't really move and it's dark and they're tied together, any people trying to escape would uh, have difficulty. 
Okay, so is there a skill that you think you could use to in order to determine if you can achieve that, or or would you just want to try dexterity? Uh, evaluate maybe, and I think the underlying characteristic for that is intelligence. I think oh, uh, if it's all right, we'll go dexterity because then I can use it as a strength for uh, how strong the knot is. Oh, sure, I got you. Thanks. As Astrid's doing that, the three of you inside the tavern see three followers of Moor walk in through the door. Black robes, white skulls painted on their face, black feathers on their heads. They walk in and everyone looks round. And the three followers of Moor approach the innkeeper at the bar and they begin speaking with him quietly. And the innkeeper's face turns red visibly. And a heated yet hus- hushed discussion is taking place. Uh, I'm going to try and lean in on that conversation. Okay. So make me a perception test, because you don't have, like, read lips or anything like that, do you? No. Okay. Fisk wants to <laughs> listen in, too. Uh, he has a nice drunk reason for it. Okay. <laughs> so both of you make me a perception test. It's going to be hard, so uh, minus 10. Curses. I failed. Like- oh, man. I'm it just the nose. Oh, well. I'm going to roll one more time because uh, I've got my last fortune of the night. Oh. Astrid, how did you go? <laughs> oh, oh, shit. shit. Was muted. Uh, that is two well, success levels. I did not hear Excellent. anything. I'm murmuring to the river people next to me. Are they here for me? Am, am I dead? <laughs> okay, I'm going to try rolling again. Am I already dead? Nice. The boatmen are patting you on the back, putting you at ease. You tell me if I was dead, right? Right? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you if you're dead. Calm down. <laughs> um, Deatrick, that was an 86. Yeah. You can't hear anything, but as you guys are paying attention to them, well, at least Deatrick certainly is. During this heated discussion, you see a few coins exchange hands between the followers of Moore and the innkeeper, and he nods his head, and then the followers of Moore turn to leave. Uh, wait, to leave the uh, inn? Yes. Okay. I'm taking uh, Fisk and Jean with me as I follow out. As I, yeah, I follow them. Okay, right. they, yeah, they, sure, I'll come help. Yeah, sure, I'll come help. Yeah. Astrid, as you finish tying this pretty decent knot, it's uh, strength of two coming uh, back up the dock and up the embankment that leads to the inn. You see the three followers of Moor coming back out of the inn and walking back towards their boat. And you also see your three companions not far behind them, clearly keeping an eye on them as they come round the side of the tavern. Where am I positioning wise? Am I still inside like the couple's boat, the Moor's boat? Were you going to check the couple's boat? Yes. Okay, in that case, as you're on their boat looking around, you can't find anything suspicious. But that's when you see the three followers walking down towards their boat and your three companions peeking around from the side of the tavern. Uh, I'm assuming it'd be too noticeable if they saw this burly uh, Hulk Hogan female cosplayer try and scramble out of a boat. You have surprisingly high stealth. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's marked for an urban environment. And I don't know if this is specifically urban or... No, uh, I'll lay low in the boat. And I guess if I really need to, I'll try and discreetly cut the rope if I absolutely need to. uh, Tie in the two boats. What are the other three of you doing as you watch these cultists approach their boat down the embankment? You've no idea that Astrid's on the other boat. Well, I think we'll just stay. I think as long as we as long as we're in a position to keep an eye on them. Can we also see the uh, room uh, where the lady's room is? Yeah, we'll assume that you guys went round the side of the tavern uh, where the lady's room would be. Okay. Well, it's still raining, right? No, the rain's eased off, and it's a nice, cool breeze this evening. Okay, I'm. 
you know what? I'm gonna ch- I'm gonna ask the, the innkeeper what what he was talking t- talking about with uh, those two. You keep an eye out here, okay? And then I head back in. I've got something to say to Jan when we're alone. <laughs> All right, I'm heading in. Jan, Jan, they might be here for you. I don't think so. I'm not dead, am I? I saw you dead. You're dead, John. I saw you. You what? I saw you dead. I don't Cross- believe Two that. crossbow bolts in your back. Pull the other one. I'm fine. I mean, I'm fine now. You got away. I don't know how you did it, but they're here for you. They're back. Well, I've never seen them before. Uh, and I'll just continue muttering and pleading with Jan. Uh, more or less nonsensically. <laughs> <laughs> how sh- like out of character? How schnozzed are you? <laughs> um, four negative success levels. <laughs> I'm not drunk. I'm just a very suspicious villager. So all this talk of being dead—it's like a <laughs> curse. You're trying to place a curse on me. No, Jen. I saw you. You're dead. Yeah, I'll j- I'll just get really perturbed by this, and as they walk past, I'll I'll see if any any of them catch my eye. They're they're walking down the embankment in front of you, away from you at the moment, Jan. So, so we don't meet eyes at all. No, you guys were following them out, I believe. Yeah, I'll just watch them from a distance. Okay, I'll describe to you what they're doing, and then we'll jump to Dietrich. The three cultists clamber into their boat. And Astrid, as you're hiding on the other boat, you can hear them, the creaking of the wood, their boots stepping onto the deck. And then you hear a few sounds, and you think that they're unmooring their boat to get going, but then you realize they're untying the rope from around that coffin, and you can hear them sliding it and shuffling it, the wood clanking against it. And John and Fisk, you can see these three Morians unveil a coffin from underneath a blanket and begin to try and lift it up. What the fuck? I told you! It's your coffin, John! Uh, I don't know. I won't let them take you. I won't let them take you. Well, t- I'll tell you what. What, if any of them looks at me funny, he's gonna get it. Dietrich, as you come in and approach the innkeeper, how do you broach the subject of him speaking with the Morians? I'm just gonna... Oh, like... It's funny seeing uh, Morians around here, ain't it? He gives you a look. A look that says, I don't want to talk about it, as he says. Mm-hmm. I, I start, like, fiddling with the gold ring. Nice ring you have there. What is... You seem to be upset by them. Is there any way I can help you? Make me a charm test. I'm going to have to pull up his stats and um, roll against the cool. <laughs> Impressive. Cool. 54. Okay. Okay, Google, roll 2d10. You rolled 7 and 10 for a total of 17. God damn. So, uh, I rolled 17, and my call is 54, so <laughs> I failed by two. How'd you get on, Dietrich? I'm gonna re- I'm gonna spend a fortune point to re-roll that. Okay. Oh, nice. So I succeed nice. by, uh, two. Okay, so that's a total of four, that's if we split the difference that you won by. He comes closer to you, Dietrich, and... Maybe it's because you're a friendly fellow, or maybe it's because you give the appearance of someone with a deeper knowledge and understanding of things because of your journey as a wizard's apprentice. But the innkeeper shares with you, they've come to stay here for the evening, and they were, they were requesting to keep a, a dead body in here, in a coffin, in their room, and... I, I wanted to turn them away, but I also don't want bad omens from the Morians. So, after some coin, I've agreed to let them 
keep a coffin in their room. That's pretty benign. We're uh, we're definitely getting juiced up outside. Do you think they might? Call- Are you worried about them causing trouble? I'm more worried about what's going to happen when they bring a coffin into a crowded tavern. Hmm. <laughs> okay. A uh, quick question, out of character: Does anyone have like any performance skills, like entertainment? Nope. You could probably do wrestling. <laughs> I think the last time I uh, I used my weapon skill as a uh, performance piece to play okay. with my daggers. Okay. Uh, you know, what? I'm I'm gonna head up over to Philippe. Yeah, Philippe sits playing cards with the halfling, and another couple of people have joined them. They seem to be uh... servants. Sorry. Yeah, I, I whisper to Philippe. Can I have a quiet chat with you? Oh, yes, uh, uh, of course, sir. He's just finished a hand and he says, I'll be back momentarily. He steps up and uh, goes over to a corner with you, Dietrich. Okay. Uh, you any uh, good at dueling? Putting on a show? Let me check his stats. What's he got here? Oh, nah, he's got sleight of hand but uh, no entertainment other than like gambling and stuff like that you a juggler then i'm just like i'm just wondering like if he's good at like either some sort of entertainment or can he use like a like a sword for like dueling flourishy deals he he's confident with a, a blade he'll tell you that he'll say he's no um you know duelist he he served time as a as a soldier but um yeah he's not he can't juggle or anything he's uh okay. not trained in that just gambling and other illicit things yeah well you know well you know the uh there's more there's uh more priest people they're having a they're a bit unusual so the innkeeper would like somebody to keep an eye away from them, if you know what I mean. Why don't we have like a little, uh, a friendly duel? Uh, friendly duel, there are guards for the lady here. Uh, I don't think it will be a good idea to pull our sword and begin trying to stab each other. Well, we can use like a, I take a, I take, I grab a stick from somewhere. I'll grab a pair of sticks. Why the fuck do I care about some Morians? I'm playing cards. Uh, well, we could also. You... I could also suggest that you show your tr- card tricks. He raises an eyebrow. Uh, what card tricks? <laughs> I raise my eyebrow right back at him. Fuck you! Give me the stick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got your. You got a few coins out of it. Okay, so uh, stick. me and uh, Philippe will uh, do some uh, fancy stick fighting in a way that okay. <laughs> to draw attention. Okay, then, excellent. So let's do uh, an opposed melee test. Okay. So just do basic. Just weapon skill? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Google, roll 2d10. Sorry, I didn't understand. Hey, Google, roll 2d10. You got nine and four. That makes sense. Oh, shit. <laughs> I got 86. Oh, man. So four levels of failure. Okay. Oh, my. You so, horrible duels, man. You begin <laughs> dueling with Philippe. And then, as you're dueling with him, the pair of you are hitting sticks and bumping into people's tables, bumping into people, flailing around. Because this is happening. <laughs> As this is happening, Fisk and John, you see the Morians pick up the coffin and begin loading it out of the boat. Astrid, you can hear them clanking and creaking, and you're easily able to look up and see them getting off with a coffin off of their boat. It's clearly got a body in it. From the way that they're moving, it's weighted. It's a heavy coffin. 
and the three of them are clumsily making their way up the bank towards the inn, shuffling around. It's not quite sitting on their shoulders properly, and they're quickly approaching the corner that you're waiting at. So, where are they? Well, I was planning on Astrid hanging out in the boat of the couple, just laying low, maybe inside it, in the shadows. Mm -hmm. Are you saying, or are you picturing her trying to hang around a corner or something, like near the inn? No, no, Astrid is in the boat watching them make their way up the bank. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Fisk and Jan are at the corner, and the Morians are quickly stumbling their way towards them with a big, heavy coffin. Okay. I was confused there. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, it's all right. Fisk whispers to Jan uh, in a heavily, uh, with heavy alcohol on his breath, I won't let them take you, Jan. And I stumble forward towards them. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just narrow my eyes and get get, get ready to uh, brush knuckles in case they try to grab me and throw me inside. I slur, you're not, you're not taking Jan at the uh, Morians. As you slur that at them, Fisk, the one at the front is struggling, wrestling with the coffin, and he'll say to you, who the fuck are you? <laughs> you're not taking me either. I'm not taking anyone, but try to get this coffin inside, it's bloody heavy. You're not here for Jan? Who the fuck is Jan? But you're the dead people. <laughs> yes! Jan's dead. Who is Jan? I saw it in the forest I did. <laughs> Fucking peasants out here. I'll, I'll, I'll just stand up and aggressively shout, Oi! I'm Jan! Well, there you go then, friend. Jan is alive. He's breathing. There he is. Can we please go inside? I'm keeping my eye on you. You're not taking Jan. Pleasure to meet you, Jan. I'm just making friends. Sounds they like we're about to get into a way. fight. <laughs> As this is happening, inside, Dietrich and Philippe continue to bump into people, and Dietrich accidentally smacks Philippe's arm a little too hard, and cards begin to fall out of his sleeve onto the floor. Oh, and you hear, oh no. You hear the halfling <laughs> shout out, You thieving Bretonian bastard! Jumps up from the table and begins trying to assault Philippe. <laughs> Doing a bit tits up here. Yeah. Well, not for me. Deatrick, are you going to try and intervene? Well, I, I'll accidentally, on purpose, knock the uh, halfling away. <laughs> <laughs> this okay. Is into a cluster Roll me a, a weapon skill test. Politely speaking, and respectfully speaking. Out of character. Okay, I succeed. Excellent. How much did you succeed by? Uh, zero success levels. Oh, excellent. Okay, then. So you don't hurt him, but you knock him away back on the floor. And as he bounces onto his bum on the floor, you hear Gunnar from across the tavern stand up, point at Philippe, and say, I knew that, Stephen, that we were six shillings light in our purses. And that bastard nicked him while we were sleeping. <laughs> Bless Philippe's heart. He met us and his life went to shit. I mean, Dietrich. to be fair, the first thing he did when he met us was try to cheat us at cards. Well, not just try, succeeded. Dietrich, yeah. the doors to the tavern slam open and the Morians come stumbling in with the coffin. And you guys have stirred up so much attention that everyone has gone quiet and is watching you guys. And as the door slams open, everyone looks at the Morians coming in with the coffin as they bumble forth with it, bumping on their shoulders as they try to climb up the stairs of the tavern. You can see the innkeeper with his head in his hands, just shaking his head as Philippe begins to pull out his purse and return money to the halfling. Well, some plans are a bit optimistic, aren't they? And that's where we'll leave it this week, guys. <laughs> I got <gotcha>. you. <laughs> okay. Sounds pretty good. Knights of the Braille are groups of blind, visually impaired, and sighted tabletop role-playing game enthusiasts. 